Right after high school, I had my first um, episode of depression. Right about that time, I discovered alcohol and recreational drugs. <laughs> well, over the years, you know, I drank more and more. And my body and soul and brain were all at war with each other. So in June of 2011, I said uncle, and I went to my first AA meeting. And um, I haven't looked back since. You see, recovery is an action word. We have to dig in and dig out that person that we were meant to be. You see, I'm a survivor of sex trafficking from the age of 13 to almost my 18th birthday. I was taken from my home and my family, and I was forced to do things that no one should ever have to do. I am not an inspiration. I really want people to understand, because sometimes my story has been tried to be used as a commodity. Oh my God, that's so amazing. Tell me about everything that you lived through, because I'm not just a survivor of sex trafficking. 53 minutes. I'm a person, and sometimes I just want to live as a normal person when my brain is trying to convince me that I'm not normal. You wouldn't have told me that at 14 when I first tried to commit suicide and my mom thought I was trying to get attention. Pretend like the things that we see our children go through are about attention. So what happens when brokenness can't help brokenness? Like seriously, thank you for allowing me to realize how resilient I could be and then I could teach other people to be just that resilient. Because see, recovery is never about the fall. It's always about the comeback. A lot of times I would come home from high school and just go in my room and just cry. And just feel all that sadness. All of a sudden in college I would be up at 2, 3 in the morning vacuuming. I'd be up for 24 hours straight. Maybe a few days later I'd be in the bed sleeping 12 hours just crying nonstop. I went to the mall and I spent $1,000 within an hour. A few years later, I just couldn't take it. I took the bottle out and I put the pills in my hands. And without hesitation, I swallowed, praying to God, please take me. And then I woke up the next morning. And the first thing I thought of was, damn, I'm so stupid, I couldn't even kill myself right. The pain never went away. The problems were still there. So I finally said, I've got to do something. So I opened up to my family. And that's when I went and got help. I teach at a public education school, and I actually teach at a middle school level. And I have been very open with my students about my struggles, about coping with my mental illness. And it has been amazing. It has been amazing to hear the students talk about it among each other, about the struggles they've had to deal with. Like three years ago, I was named Teacher of the Year for my school. Oh. And then last year, I was actually named the health and PE teacher for the whole county. So, not bragging by any means at all, but I just want people to see, damn it, you can have a mental illness and still accomplish things in your life. And it makes a difference. And so you don't see all of the panic and the worry about making a mistake. If you know how the inner workings of a duck go, like you see them just smoothing, you know, across the lake, the top of them, you know, nothing's ruffling their feathers, <laughs> literally. But underneath, they are working so hard. Everything is going, going, going. If you could see me, that is what the inside of me looks like. Very interesting to be able to help my daughter through the anxiety that she has when I'm still doing it myself. I think it is important in order for us to remove the isolation that often comes with mental illness through sharing what I have gone through with my anxiety, it's actually connected to me to other people that I never would have connected with otherwise. Not one size fits all, which I think is very important. Um, when we're all talking about it and we all look different, we all sound different, we all have different experiences, some very traumatic, some not as traumatic, but it all counts. But when those bad days come, I am not that strong advocate who knows what she's doing. And the shame of that forces me straight into isolation. The fact that I am so depressed and anxious that I can't do this is just more proof that I'm just conning people by pretending like I have any idea what I'm doing with my mental health. But with therapy, I have learned more self-compassion. Still working on it, but this became easier a lot faster than I was going to. This policy of honesty that has driven me now. 
pushing against the shame that made me who I am. And now I've been able to gain more control of my fears of being invalidated due to my mental health. Is this familiar to you? Your head hurts, your chest hurts, you can't breathe, you got racing thoughts, they're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And you're thinking, what in the world is happening? Is this real? Well, guess what? It was very real for me. I struggled as a woman of color. I struggled as a woman in ministry. And then a woman with mental health illness. I had a triple whammy. You see, in the faith community, mental health illness really doesn't exist. It's the open secret in the church. It's what we don't talk about that we really do need to talk about. And I'm a recovering anorexic perfectionist. My husband says that I can light up any room with my smile. But if you could see me, you would know that most days I feel small and scared and trapped inside my own head. I go into my closet and I pull out a pair of skinny pants that I'll never actually wear anywhere, but I have to make sure the button snaps before I can go on about my day. I wanted to talk about my depression and what it's like to really live with this disease. It's not a sin, it's not a demon, it's a disease. Y'all remember when the aliens would take over the body <laughs> of the human? That's what depression is like, like really. Depression comes in and it takes over your life. All the things that you are interested in and all the things that you would naturally be motivated to do and all the people that you love, that you wanna hang out with, it takes over and none of that stuff is fun. I probably was the first person that I know of to go to therapy for their issues. See, we like to cope with alcohol and drugs and sex and spending too much money and, uh, and whatever else we can cope with. And then call people crazy for going to therapy. Andre, you just blew to her. You need to be careful around boys now. Don't wear your low-cut blouses and don't wear your tight clothes and just get you a good bra. <laughs> then she gave me a long lecture about being a lady. You know, when I hear rape victims speak those words about were her clothes too tight, was her blouse too low, it sounds really familiar. And I said to him, I just went to the funeral of a person who abused me physically, verbally, and sexually and made my childhood a living hymn. He said the most powerful words to me I've ever heard in my life. If I had been around, he would have been dead a long time ago. This was my validation. I'm not wrong. I don't need to be ashamed. I don't need to be shunned. And I wasn't deserving of this unwanted attention. My blouses weren't too low. I wasn't asking for any of this. My clothes aren't too tight. I'm sorry I bloomed too early. I was simply being me, and I realized today that me is good enough. And I'm not sorry that my truth might make some of you uncomfortable. I am free, but my journey for healthy love still continues. But somehow, I remember vividly every single time my ex laid his hands on me. I can remember most of the details from the night in Richmond when I was raped, including what I was wearing. I can remember all the times I was called fat or shamu. And I remember the first time I ever cut myself, sitting on my bedroom floor with a horrible Taylor Swift song playing in the background. <laughs> I was silent about my beliefs and my mental state for so long that I was convinced no one would ever bother to listen. I had friends and family who deeply loved me, but I wanted to die. I didn't allow myself to get professionally diagnosed until about three years ago. And a few things have been helpful since then. I am medicated happily, without the shame that, you, that I used to carry when the thought of medication would come up. When I was in high school, um, I struggled with my mental health due to a lot of traumas that I had endured. Some of you may have um, heard of a disorder called dissociative identity disorder. Well, that's something I live with every day. Um, the school psychologist blindly said to me one time, that I didn't belong anywhere but in a mental institution. Oh my God. If he could only see me, yeah. he would know how resilient I am. Yes. He would know that I would go on to graduate with honors mm. from high school, be awarded a Rotary Club scholarship to go to school, 
graduate with honors from a prestigious undergraduate program, mm. go on to get my master's degree, and nice. I am currently pursuing my PhD. I was afraid that if I stood up in front of you, you being the world, and if you found out who I really was, that you wouldn't love me, that you couldn't respect me. If people found out who Aaron really was, they would leave. A few years ago, I decided that I was gonna start standing up anyway. And the thing that I discovered in standing up in front of rooms full of people over and over and over again, and telling you what was true about me, is that you loved me more. And that you desperately needed to hear what was true about my experience so that it made you feel safe to talk about your own.